So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 2017 Cybersecurity Symposium. I'm Tom Locke, Vice President of Security for Bias Corporation, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Session nine, managing your users and applications across an on-premise, hybrid, and cloud-based environment. I'm pleased to introduce our panel today. We have Subo Ayer, Avinash Sanklar, and Manny Fernandez. Gentlemen, could you introduce yourselves and where you're at and what you do? Subu? Sure. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm Subu Ayer. I'm a Senior Director of Product Management at Oracle. I drive product management for identity management in the Oracle Cloud, as well as some of the cloud security products. Anyway, good morning. I'm Avinash Sankla. I'm a senior director with uh, Bias Corporation. I oversee most, or rather all, of Bias Corporation's uh, clients and customer base on the West Coast. Many of them, of course, are from state and local. And um, the good part is I have grown up from the technology side, so I do understand and I provide uh, technology and architecture services around uh, identity and security management too. Hi, and I'm Manny Fernandez. I'm a cybersecurity specialist. I uh, focus on security from a data application identity perspective. Uh, lately, we've also been doing a lot of work in the systems operation side, where we are kind of converging those two fields to look at a, a new way of managing security. I cover the West Coast primarily for Oracle and work with a lot of public sector agencies at the state uh, and local agency levels. Thank you, guys. So as the perimeter fades, a new perimeter is identified in the form of the user. Securing that information and applications and services that organizations share today really requires an identity-centric model for you to follow. These users cross network and brick and mortar boundaries and must be backed by advanced series of solutions that can analyze, identify the new generation of threats that are coming to all of us today. So let's get started. Subu, what are the main challenges organizations face today as they undertake a digital transformation of their applications? Yeah. Um, so at Oracle, we work with a number of organizations that are undergoing digital transformation. And by digital transformation, it could involve something as simple as adopting a SaaS application across the enterprise, something like Salesforce, maybe an Oracle application, deploying that for improved productivity in the enterprise, to sophisticated usages of the cloud, like moving entire applications or workflows or policies to the cloud. We see the entire spectrum of digital transformation projects. Um, the, if, you were look, if you were to look at the key challenges that enterprises are facing when they undertake these projects, we like to look at them in terms of like three buckets that helps us compartmentalize what they typically run into. The first thing is identities. As applications and data are moving to the cloud, how do you allow your users, whether they are enterprise users or external users like consumers, to have a seamless experience accessing those applications and that data in the cloud? That means extending your identities from on-premises to the cloud, where they may be residing in Active Directory or maybe an LDAP directory. How do you seamlessly extend them into Workday and Salesforce and the Oracle application and so on, Office 365 and so on? Access controls, authorizations, entitlements for these users are all aspects around <coughs> this identity bucket, the way we look at it. That's one of the fundamental things enterprises think about, saying, how do I extend these to the cloud? The second thing that we, run into, we, we find enterprises grappling with is uh, ensuring data privacy. So a lot of companies, obviously, definitely, um, you know, those in the public sector as well, they spend a lot of time crafting their corporate security policy for applications in the cloud. What data am I going to allow in the cloud and what am I not going to allow? For instance, if, if, an, if an enterprise rolls out, let's say, uh, a cloud storage solution across the enterprise, they have strict policies saying, my enterprise users or my users shall not upload documents in the storage service that I have that contains credit card numbers of my customers or, or other sensitive information. How do I govern that? How do I check that? So how do you craft a policy and enforce it for data privacy? And the third final piece is, it really the first two really naturally lend to the third, is monitoring. 
how do I continuously monitor and track what is going on in these applications and the data that is associated with them so that I can remediate in real time? What tools do I have that allows me to peek into the cloud applications, my, my user activity, my data, and make sure that my policies are being, but are being enforced? So really, identities, ensuring data privacy, and monitoring are really the three buckets, Tom, that um, I, would, I would classify uh, most enterprises as, being str as struggling with. So why are these important, and what are the downsides <coughs> of ignoring Sorry. these security oh, aspects? Um, besides the obvious aspect of losing data, um, uh, of potentially losing data in the cloud on, in your applications, um, uh, there are several financial implications as well. Obviously, I mean, a number of companies are um, in the news for all the wrong reasons these days about losing data, sensitive data in the cloud. Um, about 140 million Americans lost their sensitive information in the cloud just last week uh, because of a data breach. Um, so there are significant aspects to losing corporate information, enterprise information, as well as your customers' information in the cloud, as well as your users' um, uh, data and identities in the cloud. Um, Interestingly, uh, Gartner points out, according to a, an analyst study, that about 60% of digital businesses by 2020 will encounter some sort of service disruption in their digital transformation projects because IT teams have just not thought about something from a security perspective. That's an ominous stat that Gartner put out just late last year, right? And interestingly, um, uh, Verizon's uh, data breach uh, investigation report, the DBIR report of 2017, interestingly points to a trend. It points to a trend that breach detection times are unfortunately increasing. And we are not talking seconds to minutes. We are talking weeks to months. So most data breaches actually go undetected for weeks or months before they are even detected, before the enterprise goes, oh, I have an ex exfiltration going on to this country, I didn't even know about it. So that's a, that's a pretty ominous stat that the industry is facing right now. Absolutely. Manny, you and I have been involved in, in breach analysis and data breaches in our past lives. Can you tell a little bit uh, about folks, kind of what that process is and what can be involved in that? Because there are, yeah. can be a significant amount of steps that have to be undertaken and the cost can be absolutely yeah. astronomical. So just from a breach perspective, um, what, what usually happens is a lot of organizations tend to get active right after the breach once there's an, there's an incident that has been detected. Um, I'd say from a discovery point of view, one of the things that they tend to lack is a lot of audit trails and logging because they didn't have the right mechanisms deployed or put into place. So um, it's important. Um, you know, for, for organizations to kind of holistically manage security, right? Apply kind of different tools or the different capabilities out there. For example, um, a lot of organizations still don't have multi-factor authentication. It's a very basic step that you can take. It goes beyond a traditional, uh, what I would call a credential, a username and a password. It ensures that, uh, you know, you, you have access to your data uh, through a stronger authentication process. Uh, and what that does, in essence, is it builds a trail so that in the event of an incident, um, you know what trails to go after, uh, start to identify the different type of threats, uh, and you don't, you know, it, it kind of gives you some place to uh, lead your investigation towards. Now, the organizations that don't have this are completely left hang, hanging, you know, all, all empty with no data. Um, they have nothing to go after. They have no uh, evidence to give them the opportunity to you know, relieve themselves of kind of the legal consequences that will come downstream from it. Yes. So, so we and Tom, if I may add to that, I Please think do. the most important part is governance around all of these different policies, right? Many companies or many organizations today, they don't have stringent policies put into place or uh, streamlined processes to go around how to manage this audit trail, how to manage the log files to get all the information that comes through. And I think that's a key aspect, right, which has to be built upon. Uh, with the absence of that, or a not a mature scale of processes and policies put into place, that's where the challenge of managing a data breach or managing security issues that could come through across your network, your application, your systems, especially with the cloud and the hybrid nature that we see today with mobility coming in the mix, uh, applications sitting uh, various places, could be your on-prem or could be in the cloud, 
on how they all come together, it has to be governed at some level. So I think that's a pretty key important aspect that's missing at a certain stage, which needs to be taken at a final look with to make sure that all of these different aspects are put together. So, I mean, we've talked about this and, and all that's going on. Isn't uh, this really what a security operations center is really for? Isn't it supposed to be there to detect and, you know, identify threats in real time? Yeah, I'm glad you bring, bring that up because that is another aspect that enterprises struggle with. A traditional security operations center um, traditionally relies on three things to basically respond to threats or detect threats. Uh, there's a technology aspect, there's a people aspect, and there are processes. So they put together technology, people, and processes to basically detect threats and respond to them. And they're struggling on all three of those axes. Um, let's talk about the technology angle, right? If, you, if For a reasonably large size organizations, with let's say you know, 5,000 to 10,000 users, um, you know, reasonably large, they're dealing with about 150,000 alerts a day from various products, from their firewall, from their endpoint systems, from their applications. They're struggling to basically say, which ones do I respond to? Like, which alerts are meaningful, which alerts are false positives, right? So technology has a lot of catch up to do to intelligently tell enterprises, hey, here are the distilled set of events that you need to respond to. So we have a technology challenge. Uh, processes, uh, so uh, people have put together elaborate manual processes to say the first level SOC analyst needs to do this. So do you get an event saying, hey, malicious activity detected from 172.10.12.14, and the first level SOC analyst says, all right, the first thing I need to do is figure out who the user is. And then the next thing that they do is what entitlements they have. There is an elaborate set of manual processes that they need to do, and that's just cumbersome. And the third thing is on the, on the people side, obviously, the, because of the processes, the processes are so manual, people face shortage of resources. You just don't have enough cybersecurity resources. That's one of the most sought after skill set in the, in, in the country today. You just don't have enough people to throw at this problem right now. Right, and to add to that, I think a very important aspect is any SOC that you see in place has to be extremely agile. If you think about digital transformation, right, we have different components of systems come in the mix. We have the cloud, the on-prem we talked about, different network components, and they're ever-changing. Different business units want their different softwares to come in or their different systems to come and get embedded into the enterprise realm of all different systems. So a SOC cannot be streamlined based on saying that we have standard of these processes or these regulations we need to follow. They have to be agile and keep evolving over time, right? You have to do everything. I mean, it goes from your skill set of people involved how closely are you associated with the knock center that you have internally? How do you monitor all these events? What action you take? What remediation action you take? Do you manage all of them? Do you uh, archive all of these to make sure? Do you keep track of uh, malicious activity coming through? And, and you are normally coming uh, based on people who are internally working within the organization also, because that's a pretty critical component, right? Most of the hacks and breaches that we see are happening typically from people who are within the organization. That's what we've heard so much about. So I think it's a good combination of being agile, uh, being closely associated with the NOC centers that you have within the organization, and that's what the SOC needs to be comprised of. Evolve your processes over time, keep an eye on that, have stringent government, governance policies, make sure you're compliant with all the regulations that the government has, especially in state and local that we have today. And a great example is um, the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, we did a lot of work for them in the identity management space. Uh, in fact, uh, some of these gentlemen are here. Uh, and we were deeply involved in helping them build that SOC practice to come up. Uh, when they embarked on the mission of implementing an entire identity security management system for provisioning, for reconciliation across uh, their HR systems, their financial systems, it was a behemoth task, right? Processes had to be built. They had to be streamlined. They had to be looked into to make sure that they cater to what else is coming through. And that's just that's the first step. As and when things move forward, we had to get and embed the knock center. What events are they capturing? How will that impact uh, based on different dashboards that we have? And it has to be done in real time. I mean, like Subhu mentioned initially, Verizon, for example, their study. It takes a while till you find out when a breach is. We have to be um, 
on top of what is happening, when those events are coming through, and make sure, based on different systems, different applications involved, different agents that you can put on different uh, components of your architecture, to make sure you can capture in real time and take actionable, intelligent uh, action on that. I think CCFL is a great example, the city and county of San Francisco. And um, I think they are at a great stage where they've got their SOC up to a level, I wouldn't say it's a highly matured situation, but they built up from ground up and they've moved in the right direction. Uh, in fact, we worked very closely with uh, Dr. Jackson Mohire, you heard today morning at the, key, at, at the keynote. And uh, he had a great hand to play in getting all this set up and move it to the next, to the next level. So we've talked about a couple of examples and what a modern sock should look like. Subu, what are the components of a modern sock these days? Yeah, um, there's actually published research by analysts about what an intelligent sock needs to look like. I mean, Gartner terms it an intelligent sock, Forrester calls it something else. Um, <coughs> there are some fundamental components to an intelligent sock. Basically, the intelligent sock is b based upon the premise that you need to move away from the model where you are constantly trying to prevent a threat from happening. Gartner says, move on from that state. Your applications and data are outside your perimeter now. Get to a point, get comfortable with the idea that maybe there are, there are people who, who, who are in your network, because there is no network any longer in your, in your perimeter. There are people who may have access to your applications who should not. How do you mitigate the damage? How do you detect it? How do you respond to it? So it really broadens the, the definition of a SOC from prevent to prevent, detect, respond, and predict is really what the model talks about. At the, it, has, it involves threat intelligence. Uh, threat intelligence may come in from your endpoints, your application data, from the network. So threat intelligence is a core part of an intelligent SOC. Um, uh, it needs to be um, uh, ad adaptive. For instance, uh, it needs to know the context in which an activity is happening or an event is happening, and then appropriately be able to take action on it. It has to be automatable. That's one of the key things that Gartner talks about. So whatever you're putting together in an intelligent SOC needs to be something that can be automated by a process, and, and of course governed by policy and so on. And at the center of it, they basically put identity. None of this is useful or relevant without being able to correlate who the user is. For instance, if you are detecting threat intelligence from an endpoint, this, they say you need to be able to correlate right at the beginning saying, I'm seeing malicious activity from user X, instead of you having to figure that out down the process, right? And the same thing goes for adaptive. For instance, if you are seeing user activity for a particular user, let's say at 3 a.m. in the night, when typically the user's activity is typically found between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Pacific time, that's anomalous activity. That's context that you need to know for that user. And then finally, automation as well. If you see particular activity for a particular user, you need to be auto automated. Um, Oracle's identity SOC is actually an implementation of the intelligence SOC. We comprise the identity management infrastructure in the Oracle cloud. We call it the identity uh, cloud service. It works closely with the CASB cloud service, cloud access security broker, and the security monitoring and analytics cloud service, which is a SIM service. Uh, so identity management, cloud access security broker, and SIM closely work together to provide this kind of an intelligence SOC. So, I mean, as a follow-up, you know, how do all these tools really help you? How should a modern SOC actually help an organization? Oh, uh, an intelligent SOC will basically help you optimize each of the three axes that we talk about uh, that we talked about earlier: the people side, processes side, and the technology side. An intelligent SOC, for instance, where let's say cloud access security broker and identity are tied closely together, when it detects activity, even the detection will tell you exactly the context of what it is seeing. For instance. If a particular user uploaded a file in box that contains credit card numbers of your customers, it, the events, even the alerts that it tells you saying, hey, I'm seeing um, credit card sensitive information, so your DLP policy got violated in user Joe Smith's box directory, and which happens to be exposed to the public because its configurations are not right. It gives you the complete context versus you having to now parse each one of those and put that together. So it basically helps you to optimize each of the three axes and be more responsive. So I, I know everybody out here is probably going, identities in the cloud, right? Really? 
really. Are organizations comfortable with uh, managing their identities in the cloud today? We do. I mean, I, I work for the identity division in um, Oracle, and we are increasingly seeing organizations moving their identities to the cloud. I mean, we, 2016 was probably the first year where we saw enterprises um, moving st uh, identities as well as applications to the cloud, not despite the cloud, but because of the increased security posture that they perceived in the cloud. The collective economies of scale from the investments that companies like Oracle, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and others are making in securing the cloud probably exceeds what an individual organization can make to protect their you know, individual applications and data. And people are beginning to get their arms around that yeah. saying, yeah, I, I trust the collective intelligence that these companies are putting in. So yes, we do see uh, companies moving identities. To the but are they managing like enterprise users or consumer users in the cloud as well? Uh, we see both. Um, in fact, in the public sector, we have several examples yeah. of people actually moving consumer identities in the cloud. So yeah. Avi, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Give us kind of a case study of, about managing identities in the cloud? Absolutely. I think a great example is we are working with one of the largest school districts on the west coast, of course. And if you think about it, we have an on-premise situation where we have all identities on the on-premise platform today. The next step is how do we take advantage of a cloud-based identity provider solution, right? Uh, of course, you're using the Oracle solution in this case. Uh, the prime area would be you first subdivide your groups of identities that you have. Your users could be divided, subdivided into three different areas. For example, at the school district I talked about, uh, they have students. That's a large population. They have employees, which includes staff, teachers, principals, so on and so forth. And the third component is parents. Now, if you think about it, parents or kids, that's a humongous amount of you know, a population for a user base that comes through with different domains. They need social interaction, um, min maintaining, managing those identities on your on-premise systems along with where you have identities for, say, students and employees is kind of a cumbersome task. You have to have a thin line of bifurc bifurcation between these identities as compared to what you want for your parent identities to come in because they have simple access and uh, controlled access to what the parents should see and what they should be available, what should be made available to them. In that case, that's when the plan is or the move or the design is to move that parent subgroup of all components and identities to the cloud. So that's a great approach. I mean, if you think about it, organizations have invested heavily on premise. There's a cycle for that from your hardware cycle, your software sales cycle, your licenses get over. It's not something you just want to lift and shift at this point in time. So there is a trend depending on where you are in your cycle with your own organization. But in this case, it's a step-by-step -step process, just given the behemoth size of the organization itself. So move the parent aspect, the parent identities into the cloud using a cloud-based identification approach. Uh, of course, using tools like CASB that Subhu mentioned, um, and the existing identities for students and uh, employees is typically kept on premise. So that's a great example that we're seeing today. And I believe there are other organizations that uh, we have started talking to right now uh, that are thinking about this on the same lines. We are talking to a healthcare provider in Southern California itself that has a similar issue. They want to break it up, move some of the providers and vendors onto a cloud-based identity platform. So I think these are some great um, movements towards a cloud-based identity platform that customers are looking at from a state and local perspective too in the, in the public space. So Manny, yeah. tell us a little bit about the advantages when you talk about time to market when doing this. Yeah, so you know, with traditional identity, I'm not sure how many of you have gone through it, but it does take time, it takes effort, it takes knowledgeable people to kind of stand it up and, and, and bring it to a point where uh, you get value out of it. Uh, what we are seeing is kind of a, a pretty large expansion of uh, cities, counties, states using cloud applications. And they need an identity to protect the access to that application or to enable access to that application. So uh, they're looking at doing modern protocols like social-based login. They don't want people to just register and sign in and get an email. They're looking for ways to engage people using their Google login, their Facebook login, uh, different type of social... Uh, what I would call uh, open standards. Uh, how many of you have heard of OAuth or OpenID, right? I mean, these are the kind of protocols that you want to consume. They're quick to deploy. They're fast to market. So taking the school example, we, we started talking to them a few months ago. 
they wanted to onboard about half a million parents. It's a pretty large school district. They didn't have the time to go out there and deploy IDM for six months. They wanted something fast. They wanted something easy. They didn't want uh, parents who didn't know, you know how to do all these advanced complex steps to go through a long registration cycle. They were like, let's make it easy. If you're gonna build a phone app, they should just hit F Connect or G Connect or whatever is out there, get access to it, onboard the identity and give them immediate access to students' information, the ability to manage their lunch programs as an example. We're taking on other profile information to manage maybe their bus routes. So we're taking these concepts now and we're applying it at the city level and at the county level. If you want to engage with your citizens, you don't have the time to go build identity. You want to build um, an application like the CIO this morning had mentioned, you know, with the, uh, the app dev playbook, right? You could do a quick DevOps cycle. You build a quick app that you can interact with your citizens and you switch on this identity as a service and you give people quick access so you can interact with them. Maybe you're, you're exposing open data that you have to do something uh, you know, that, that would be socially viable. Or maybe you're looking for them to engage with you to maybe pay your, uh, your annual tax bill for your property uh, taxes. Or maybe uh, from a uh, law enforcement perspective, uh, maybe parking tickets as an example, or some other kind of seizures activity. So we're giving them these tools, we're putting it in the cloud, we're securing the cloud experience, and then most importantly, they're giving them visibility around those clouds with a cloud access security broker, uh, which you know the team has been talking about here. What that gives you is security beyond your perimeter. There is no perimeter. This is a common discussion I have with a lot of people when I get into the organization. They tell me they have a firewall, they have an intrusion detection system, an intrusion prevention system, and they have all these scanners and beautiful, amazing technology, right? But they still experience breaches. It's because they're not securing the, the user experience. They're not protecting the identity. They're not encrypting the data. They're not doing these basic hygiene things. They're just building firewalls and perimeters and all these other cool things on the edge. And, and then all it takes is a user to you know, go home with an iPad and dial right back home, and that whole user channel is, is insecure. So what we wanna do is capture those events happening outside the cloud, because uh, we talk directly to these cloud SaaS providers using APIs. We don't depend on monitoring the perimeter and putting a piece of software on the device and monitoring that device. Those things are difficult to scale, difficult to go to market, requires longer deployment, testing cycles. We're trying to take Easy to use, easy to leverage, quick to consume, uh, you know, capabilities and protocols um, that, that hopefully make you successful and, and engage you with your citizens out there. Excellent, thank you. Now we've, <laughs> we've, we've must have heard CASB about six or seven times here and I know everybody's yeah. probably going and thought about this and said, well, did I really know about this thing called CASB before I came in here or Cloud Access Security Broker? So, Sub, I'm going to ask you. You know, can you tell us what uh, what does a CASB help you with, and what is the primary use case for using a CASB? Sure. I mean, uh, talk about an alphabet soup of uh, letters <laughs> here. Uh, CASB yeah. sounds for Cloud Access Security Broker, um, and Gartner actually coined this term I think about five years ago. And there are a bunch of vendors that actually do CASB technology. Oracle is one of the leading vendors in uh, in CASB technology. There are two fundamental use cases that uh, CASBs are typically deployed for. One is what we call the shadow ID problem. When an enterprise says, um, I don't think I'm using any cloud applications because I told my employees no cloud applications and I'm pretty sure nobody's using them. And we go, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and then we go in and we find, well, there are only about 350 cloud applications that your people are using and about everything ranging from Box to Dropbox. True story, by the way. The numbers are actually true and this actually really happened. Um, so that's one, to provide visibility into a company's um, cloud applications usage. So a, a CASB like Oracle's can really take network feeds, let's say a day's worth of, or a month's worth of your firewall logs. Crunch that into the CASB and the CASB says, well, you have about 300 applications being used. Here is the risk posture of those applications. So maybe Dropbox is not that insecure, but hey, your users are uploading data into that application and that is very insecure based on the um, risk posture that we have for various applications. 
That's the shadow IT problem. And the second problem is the sanctioned cloud applications. So there are many enterprises that say, hey, we are deploying Office 365. We are deploying the Google Suite. How do I make sure that my corporate security policies are enforced in this target application? So a CASB can essentially monitor the target application, the sanctioned application, and, and the data and the activity associated with that application and make sure that your policies are conformed to at all times. The moment it detects a DLP violation, an access violation, a misconfiguration, for instance, if we detect that somebody made one of your box folders public, it'll tell you, hey, one of your box folders is public, you really wanna respond to that, right? It can basically track and monitor your sanctioned cloud applications and become your policy enforcer. So yeah. those are the two key use cases we see. So this is kind of a question for all of you here. I mean, can you share some examples of organizations that benefit from deploying a CASB? And, you know, what type of threats do they find and prevent by using a CASB? Yeah, I can, I mean, in fact, I have an article here that came out of the Wall Street Journal on Sunday. And uh, the best part of it is unexpected security problems in the cloud. And they talk about the sanctioned applications in the cloud and the biggest reason we have security breaches is misconfiguration in the cloud. Now that's pretty interesting, right? He talked about a Dropbox example. You could go and misconfigure something to make those folders accessible to everybody. That's where a CASB can come in, for example. But the bottom line being is you have sanctioned applications, non-sanctioned, on-premise. I mean, that's the new paradigm of IT today. With everything in the cloud, there are, you have a skill set of resources who go configure something, you get consultants in, you get you know, different companies to help you through. So there are a lot of different moving parts doing different things across the board. So what's important is at least to make sure that you have something that can go across all these applications, on-prem, cloud, sanctioned, unsanctioned, to make sure to monitor everything. And that's where CASB comes in. I think from a technical perspective, probably Manny has more in-depth detail about it. But in a nutshell, when we look at uh, the public sector or organizations that are moving in this direction, digital transformation is where we started, right? Everything is moving with an advent of the cloud. You have documents, you have systems, you have uh, different uh, applications that we put up over there with very sensitive information and data going up there from school districts to state and local to um, private entities also. So I think that's where these brokers that monitor all your applications at the same point in time, gather information, uh, have an intelligent look into what's going on in real time and alert you so that you can respond based on what actions, principles, policies, regulations, what compliance policies you have in place. That's the key component of where CASB can help you from that perspective. Yeah, and you know, just to add to CASB, right? I mean, the question uh, that I don't present anymore to you know, CIOs, CISOs I meet with is, are you aware of cloud activity within your organization? Um, is it because they know it's going on and they have no way to baseline it. Um, they have no understanding of it. I mean, they probably see some traffic on the firewall. One of the exercises we tend to do with a lot of organizations is we tell them, hey, look, if you have no understanding of what's going on, uh, give us an opportunity to come ingest maybe five days worth of your firewall logs and connect one of the CASB trial tenants to, into maybe Office 365 and let it run for a period of 10 days. And what they get at the end of it after 10 days is amazing. They see some crazy stuff. Here's some real life examples, right? Uh, in an Office 365 connection where we set this up, um, they started noticing a hard drive being backed up in Taiwan. And um, you know they saw this activity going on for days and we're trying to figure out what the heck's going on, why? Uh, this is a pretty large uh, entity. They have critical infrastructure. I'm not gonna name them because uh, you probably fly through that airport. And um, that one of their, their biggest concerns was, um, you know, we have schematics of the buildings, and, and you know, the number one thing that terrorists are looking for is really schematics as critical infrastructure. We also noticed box accounts, who the CISO thought was secured from, uh, I want to say, anonymized links, where you don't have to authenticate to download, were being widely used, even though they thought they had a global setting switched on. And suddenly now they saw, like, multiple files being exposed, and we saw files out there that had things like um, employee data, right? I mean, you can start to put things together and think about PII. I mean, you'd be surprised how much uh, data all of us pull together in our inboxes every day that's highly sensitive. P 
PII restricted, right? We don't classify the data. It's over email. We forward these emails around. So understanding that those kind of behaviors, understanding who's accessing your mailbox when you're asleep from another country uh, is something that is beyond your firewall. Your firewall can pick this stuff up. So when we ran this tool at this organization, they saw all the gaps they had from a configuration point of view where they were exposing you know, sensitive data, from an application access point of view where people were accessing it from different geographies at different times, uh, and, then, and then really the state of the enterprise which they thought was under control. And they were able to quickly deploy some actions in place, but it doesn't really end there. I mean, you, you gotta do continuous monitoring, right? Security doesn't end at doing an audit and, and letting go of it. You need to be alerted with it. You need uh, someone to take this and classify it and put it through a process that says, you know what, maybe I don't care about a certain activity, but if I see a sensitive file that got flagged and it's being accessed from Eastern Europe at this time, flag and create a ticket. Let someone go really investigate and see if this is a big issue. Maybe it's not. Maybe your people were traveling out there for business. Uh, we saw some other weird activity on the discovery. We saw, we didn't have 350, I wanna say we probably had like 180 plus apps. We saw a ton of apps being used because they let people use phones on the internal network and they let them connect through Wi-Fi. So, you know, I bet you a good chunk of you use your Wi-Fi, I mean your phone at work. Every social app that you have on your phone is going through your network. So you're just opening up new vectors of attack. So, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, a lot of, I want to say, analytic tools and it generates lots of data and specific events tied to it. I mean, Subu. Do you really need a data aggregator for this thing, and would this thing really be something like a SIEM? Yeah, it should be a, a SIM, but it has to be an intelligent SIM. I mean, traditional SIMs or log aggregators, they basically collect all your log files together and give you an, a user interface where you, sh you can basically look for information from exactly, you, you can find the ne proverbial needle in the haystack as long as you provide a SQL query to say, find me the needle in the haystack. But you, don't know where the needle is at, right? So you need a SIM that can intelligently collect information and data from multiple different data sources and apply modern technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning on that to basically be able to predict and detect where your threats are. So you may, your information that is coming into the SIM may comprise your endpoint feeds, your application feeds, your network feeds, and so on and it intelligently has to combine that with identity logs and say, well, I'm seeing this anomalous activity for this particular user that I think you should really um, respond to. So an intelligent SIM can help you uh, considerably reduce the number of false positives that you would otherwise deal with and reduce yeah. the number of alerts that, you, that are being thrown at you. I talked about the 150,000 number with a more intelligent SIM like the Oracle SMA um, CS, the Security Man Monitoring and Analytics Cloud Service, that problem becomes considerably uh, mitigated. Yeah. So, I mean, AI and machine learning is, you know, it's the big topic of the week here and what's going on here at the conference today. How are these technologies different than the tools we had in the past? And how does an organization benefit from those Technologies. That's a question for everybody here. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Go, go ahead. ahead. All right. No, I think it's all got to do with volume of data, right? As technology has evolved and uh, systems have increased, the footprint has increased in IT, the volume of data, logs, and everything else captured is just humongous. I mean, why do you think big data and MDM are the norm of the day? I mean, I have a kid in high school who thinks about, Daddy, data science is what it's all about. But if you think about it, somebody has to go through that data, analyze it, get intelligent information coming out of that data. That's where things like AI and machine learning get in the mix, right? It's practically impossible, like Subhu mentioned, writing a SQL queries, going through things. I know we've done some of these in our current customers where uh, traditionally we've gone in there, run the script, keep running the script every five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever it is, to go figure out what's happening, to see what's going on. But using AI and ML algorithms and the intelligence involved, it's all about intelligently learning over time how to predict the anomalies coming through. I mean, a great example is, you know, you have employees who get access to Office 365. You have three licenses. So you can install one at home, one on your work laptop, or oh, I have another one. Oh, I'll give it to my kid who's in school. 
Kids go put it onto the laptop. They run down to a closer Starbucks. That's a new fad. They're on an open network. That's where they can get access to. So they are accessing through your 065, getting onto your account, but using it on their laptops. And they, of course, store things on the Google Cloud and other cloud. But that's an endpoint for people to come in, right? So if there are many such, that's one scenario. But there are many such cases that go on across on a daily basis. How do you figure out what data is important at that real point, at, you know, in real time, it should tell you exactly what's going on. And that's really critical. And you have to make sure that your systems or that your agents that you have, your CASPs or your SIMs, everything, is intelligent to give you in real time what anomaly has taken place, which IP has come from the outside. Yes, we can put in systems to say, um, restrict X IPs coming in from this country or from that country, only allow one. I mean, you never know, employee could go on a holiday to great, see the Great Wall, but um, that's what these AI and ML um, algorithms come in the mix to help analyze in real time uh, exact information that is really required that you can take action upon to make sure that uh, intrusion is detected and, um, and you mitigate all the risk associated to your systems. And I was going to add one other thing. Um, you know, just from an approach perspective, I think a lot of people today in the organizations keep uh, the SIEM or the security event uh, management solution separate from the systems monitoring. There are things that happen at a system application data level um, that, that should be identifiers for anomalies that are taking place within your organization. If there was a way for you to bring that all together to analyze that data across your on-prem, your enterprise applications, your productivity applications, and then the cloud, you'll start to see patterns. And the, the idea behind these patterns is to not go out there and start to write rules to look for them. You want these things to be you know, surfaced up and bubbled where if you're seeing activity across, say, a system, a database and a device at a particular time or from a particular IP, and maybe it's not a security incident because they didn't launch an attack on you. They do reconnaissance. They're, they're in your network for days. They're looking for stuff. I mean, this is what all the net network sec security guys tell you. But they're looking for known, uh, what I would call identifiers. They're looking for signatures. They're not really looking to see if a system's malfunctioning where you know memory has peaked or disk has peaked or something is going on. If you can collect all that, you bring the system monitoring aspect, the network security aspect, you tie that down with the identity so you know if it's a legitimate identity that's doing it, then you can tie it to an inside activity. If it's not, then you know it's an external threat. But now you're correlating a lot of data from on-prem and the cloud, and you are in a position to, to deal with it or to, to go escalate it to a point where it's maybe a severity, one type of security issue in your SOC. Right, so you're building an intelligent SOC that's not just a SIEM solution or a network solution or a uh, device solution that's monitoring for DLP. You're pulling all that together. You're using log data. You're pulling all that dog. You're, you're parsing through it, and you're using uh, machine learning and AI to really bubble up the items that matter the most up to the top. Yeah. So every journey starts with the first step. How do these folks get started in this journey? Sure, there are various options available. I mean, the, the, the barrier uh, to cloud adoption is lower than ever. Um, yesterday, Oracle actually made an uh, interesting announcement where for as low as uh, $300, you can get started with a trial cloud account and play around with the technologies that are available to you. And the kinds of technologies that are available in the cloud is just staggering. Everything from SIM to CASB services, um, to identity management, entire identity management platform in the cloud, to Java development, to uh, mobile development, and so on. You can essentially get started for that low trial, have a free trial, um, yeah. and see how it goes, and um, and, and see how, how things work out. Yeah, and from a trial perspective, some of these clouds are very easy to deploy. It's not like you're installing and configuring and you know, going through a plethora of activities, which may take, say, 300 clicks to do a particular install, and you sit in there for eight hours, it's really a cloud service. You go on, you sign up, you switch it on, and uh, maybe you put a little collector on the piece that you want to gather information from and reconfigure it back up to a gateway. So you're not doing a traditional deployment of security. You're doing something that's quick to consume. You try it out for 30 days. You see if it's beneficial to you. See if it brings value to the way you do things. Maybe frees you up from doing mundane tasks. Like, I talk to a lot of admins. No one wakes up and goes to work at 8 a.m. looking for logs. 
let's be real, right? Everyone's capturing all these beautiful logs out there. No one's looking for, uh, hey, was there an incident there last night? No, it's usually on a Friday when everyone's leaving that someone flags in and then before you know it, you know, uh, general counsel is involved. I mean, we've been through And these. you're all working the and, weekend and, and then some. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you know, you're working the weekend firefighting, you're pulling in forensics investigators, you are cloning machines to go to run forensics on them. It's really of no value. It's a, it's a post-breach uh, act. I mean, at that point, all you're really trying to figure out is how do I control brand damage? Um, and it's a bit too late. But what if you had the tools to proactively get some visibility into events uh, that may be bubbling up? So you know how to go maybe block it, right? Look, if anyone's telling you that their security can secure you, that's wrong. All we're doing is reducing the risk surface for you, right? We're trying to reduce the, uh, the vectors of attack. We're trying to prevent some ADS from happening. But you're being constantly monitored. I mean, there's a good chance there's an insider in your network uh, you don't know about. Yeah, you don't yeah. know about it, and it could be just a misconfiguration, or it could be just a lack of policy. Yeah. yeah. No, I think at the other end of the spectrum, it's all, this is all the technology part, right? It's also important to look at your processes and um, rules in place today, your policies and processes within your SOC. SOC has to be empowered, empowered to be a bottleneck also at a certain level within the enterprise. I mean, larger organizations have different business units that typically run off based on what they want to get. They'll buy the product and then come back and then say, okay, guys, this is what we have, let's integrate it. And let's get security as an afterthought. That should not be it. The paradigm shift in your mind has to be that, wait, before we go get something, get your SOC involved, get your CISO and his or her organization involved to actually go through the list of things. Does it pass my litmus test to make sure that this application or this cloud application or mobility-based application passes all these different checklists? That's important. These are my policies, these are my processes. What change will I need to change in my process if I get these new systems in place? What CASB brokers or what agents do I have or what different components I have that will monitor everything in real time to let me know if there's a problem? That's important. So it's a mind shift that has to also happen across the board within the organization itself. They have to be empowered. They have to have the final say on whether, yes, the system is acceptable within the enterprise or no. I think that's, that's the other end that is pretty critical because it's a paradigm shift in how you want to go about uh, especially embracing everything that's out there today, which is all over the place. It's all over the world, different data centers, different applications. Everybody has their own security policies, their own authentication mechanisms. But you as the enterprise, you're in the center. Yeah. At the end of the day, application A might have a great security feature, B might be slightly lower than that, but you have to make sure that you have great across the board and you can capture everything. And with that, we are at the end of our time. So if there are any questions, please feel free to ask and or we can take them at the, <coughs> at the end of the hour here. Yeah. Thank you thank so you. much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, panelists.